Okay, it looks like uh, about 10.15. So I'm gonna go on the basis of start my lecture and they will come, we'll see, okay? Uh, I wanna start by saying that uh, I have a lot of good things to say about Milton Friedman, okay? But not today. <laughs> and, and the reason is we're dealing with money and macro and not with uh, microeconomics. Um, and market theory generally. But I will say this much. I mean, if you look at Friedman uh, on issues like rent control or issues like minimum wage, issues like international trade and so on, uh, he's, he's an inspiration and he's a good debater uh, and uh, kudos to Friedman on all those things. The only thing I can't forgive him about uh, you might know that Friedman was spearhead. He spearheaded the move to end the military draft, and he succeeded. And what I can't forgive him for is he didn't do it quite quick enough to save me. I spent four years in the military. <laughs> okay. Uh, now. Today is uh, Hayek and Friedman head to head, but as you'll see pretty quickly, Keynes is right in the middle of it. He's right in the middle of everything, and so can't keep him out here. But in bringing in Keynes, we'll, we'll get a better idea about Friedman and the, his differences with, with Hayek. Uh, here we go. Start with the level of aggregation, which uh, is something I can deal with very quickly on a summary basis, but it's something I want to draw your attention to early on in this lecture. And uh, I start with an overstatement. Uh, it's not my overstatement, it comes from Axel Leyenhoven, who's a Swedish economist, but Austrian sympathizer to a large degree. Your aggregation scheme is your theory. Uh, when you pick up a macro textbook, it's almost like some throat clearing remarks about, okay, look, we've got income, we've got consumption, we've got investment, we've got government spending, so now we're ready to go. Let's, let's get some theory working here for us, okay? Uh, and yet, what you want to realize is that by specifying that as your aggregation scheme, those are the four aggregates you're going to pay attention to, that means that you've already decided that there's nothing going on within any one of those aggregates that have any claim on our attention. And of course, there's that investment aggregate sitting there uh, that will be graphed against this, that, and the other thing, but never explored in its interior, okay? And, and of course, the Austrians will say, no, no, you've got to look at the structure of capital, the structure of investments, all right? So it's a good place to start. Now, I'm going to look at the, the three of them, Keynes, Friedman, and Hayek. Let's, I think we can do it fairly quickly. Theorize, theorizing at a high level of aggregation, Keynes believed that market economies perform perversely. I had that written before as Keynes argued. He didn't really argue it, he just believed it. They behave perversely, especially the market mechanisms that bring saving and investment in line with one another. Seeing unemployment and resource idleness as the norm, that's because he was looking out the window during the 30s, the Great Depression was on. Keynes called for counter-cyclical fiscal and monetary policies, and ultimately for a socialization of investment. That's in quotes, that socialization of investments. That's in his swan song, chapter 24 of the general theory. Uh, his fiscal and monetary policies were aimed at just propping up capitalism long enough to usher in some more reasonable form of economics, namely socialism. That's Keynes, high level of aggregation. But if we look at Friedman, he's got a higher level of aggregation. Friedman, his monetarism was based on a still higher level of aggregation, the equation of exchange, MV equal PQ. More about that later. How many already know what MV equal PQ mean? Quite a few. We'll get to it that don't. Uh, Q is total output, 
everything. That, that's consumption and investment. In other words, his level of aggregation doesn't even allow a distinction between consumption and investment, although he would admit that investment tends to be a little more erratic than consumption. So it puts in eclipse the issues of the allocation of resources between current consumption and investment for the future, and certainly puts into eclipse any kind of uh, ongoings within the investment sector. But seeing no problems with the em emerging from the market itself, in other words, he's a market guy. Uh, he thinks uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand works quite well, thank you very much. So Friedman focused on the relationship between government-controlled money supply, that's the M up there, and overall price level, that's the P. So his whole focus was, was simply on that relationship between the money supply and the price level. Now here's Hayek. Capital-based macro is distinguished by its propitious disaggregations. Look that up in Webster if you don't know what. It just means well-chosen, okay? Which brings into view both the problem of intertemporal resource allocation and the potential for a market solution. Hayek showed that a coordination of saving and investment decisions could be achieved by market-governed movements in the interest rate. He also recognized that this aspect of the market economy is especially vulnerable to the manipulation of interest rates by the central bank. Well, that's, I mean, he's set the stage down on how to go about analyzing this. This, this, this. You can't handle that with monetarism. You can't handle that with Keynesianism because of your level of aggregation. So again, how methods uh, shape substance. And I'll look at methods, and once again, I'm going to start with Keynes, and you'll see why quickly enough. Uh, this is from a 1988 book by Alan Melcher, who himself is a monetarist. Uh, and look what he says. And think about this. He says, Keynes, Keynes was a type of theorist who developed his theory after he had developed a sense of relative magnitudes and of the size and frequency of changes in these magnitudes. And he looked what was moving around. Well, income's moving around. Consumption's moving around. Investment really moving around. It's flopping around, okay? Want to consider those. Uh, he concentrated on those magnitudes that changed most, assuming that the others remain fixed for the relevant period. So we're not going to look at things that don't flop around. Keynesian theory is essentially a theory that, of things that flop around a lot, okay? Uh, and I depicted this as what I call a variation sieve, sort of a metaphorical variation sieve. In other words, collect all of the data that you have on all of the magnitudes that you can think of, and then, and then find uh, whatever the sigma is, what, what's, what's the extent of variation of those, and then you pour them through this sieve, and all the things that don't seem to vary much, they fall through the sieve. The things that vary a lot stay in the sieve. So now you've got a sieve full of aggregates that flop around a lot, and those become your building blocks for macroeconomics. Now, you want to think about that. Is that a good strategy for <laughs> setting out your macroeconomics? All right. That's Keynes. Well, you couldn't expect much more from Keynes, but look what Friedman says. He says, I believe that Keynesian theory is the right kind of theory in its simplicity, its concentration on a few key variables. What does key mean? Flopping around. Key magnitudes and potential fruitfulness. By potential fruitfulness means you can use your econometric skills to analyze these things. Because any of you have taken any econometrics or statistics or whatever, you know that if you have an independent variable that doesn't change, there's no sense in putting it in. It's not going to explain any of the dependent variable. How could it? It doesn't change. If it changes just a little bit, it's still going to be swamped by things that change a lot. Okay? So uh, here they're using their econometric techniques as a criteria try for trying to figure out what's actually relevant to do. The implication here is that big effects have big causes. See, 
ultimately they want to find the cause of this, the cause of that, and so on. But they seem to think that there's a relationship between the size of the effect and the size of the cause. In fact, in fact more than that, Friedman is on record in an in um, IEA pamphlet a number of years ago where he says we, <laughs> that we're able to assume, we have a right to assume that big causes come from big effects. That's sort of uh, boilerplate to the whole enterprise. Well, of course, that's not true. Uh, now, some big causes have big effects. Some big fe effects have big causes. Um, Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii come to mind. Big cause, big effect, okay? But a careless smoker starting a forest fire, little cause, big effect, okay? And according to the Austrians, Austrians my, what seems to be a mild change in the interest rate can have a cumulative effect that eventually makes a boom unsustainable. So uh, that's part of the methodology of both uh, Keynes and Friedman about big causes and big effects. Elsewhere, uh, Friedman has actually said, this is a quote from a New York Times article, uh, about 68, I think it was, we're all Keynesians now. This is Friedman. We're all Keynesians now. Now, he was misinterpreted. He, he didn't mean to say that we're all in favor of active fiscal policy, discretionary monetary policy, uh, policies about budget deficits and so on. We're not trying to manipulate those things. To, we're not all trying to manipulate those things. How, in the, how are we all Keynesians now? Well, he clarified it in a later piece. He says, no, 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 what I meant was we all use the Keynesian language and apparatus and we could include uh, aggregation scheme, okay? Except actually Friedman is one up on Keynes by having a higher level of aggregation. That's what he meant. Well, okay, fine, he meant that, but if he meant that, then he really shouldn't have said all unless he was just forgetting about the Austrians <laughs> because they don't do that, all right? That's the distinction. They, they have a much more disaggregated uh, system. Yeah, Time Magazine, 1968, there you go. Now, look at what Hayek says. He, he's not saying big cause, big effect. I mean, the big cause, big effect are the things that uh, the local news for, uh, uh, commentator can pick up, okay? Anybody can pick that up. It takes some skill to, to look for other things. The role of the economist, Hayek points out, this is in pure, <coughs> pure theory of capital, is precisely to identify the features of the market process that are apt to be hidden from the untrained eye. In other words, the untrained eye, even the eye of the entrepreneur, is not likely to to monitor mild, fairly mild changes in the interest rate that nonetheless have cumulative effects and eventually over a period of time, the length of the boom that it's generating, uh, will reveal its unsustainability and uh, cause a collapse. That's exactly what, uh, what he had in mind. For Hayek then, the cause and effect relationship between central bank policy during the boom and the subsequent economic downturn have a first order claim on our attention. Let's figure out why this growing economy all of a sudden went bust. Was it growing too fast? If so, why? Was there something wrong with interest rates? If so, what was the policy that gave rise to that? See, that's, he, he's looking at the boom. His whole theory focuses on the boom to figure out why a bust turns out in some circumstances to be inevitable, okay? So it has a first order claim on our attention despite the more salient movements in macro magnitudes that characterize the post-crisis spiraling of economy into deep depression. So you see this subtle thing, you actually don't see it, you have to tease it out of the history of the 1920s. Uh, it, you, you understand that there was something funny going on with interest rates during the 1920s 
more so at the near the end of the 20s and in the middle, but uh, you, you sort of tease that out of your historical uh, understanding and, and you know and you find out why that then gives you a downturn. Now, it's only after the downturn starts that Friedman gets interested because it's only after the downturn starts that you see this flopping around. You see this huge drop in investment expenditure, huge drop in consumption, a huge drop in income. And the Friedmanites will say, oh, that's what we got to focus on. Or we have to make our theory out of these huge drops and see how they correlate and so on. Uh, and never mind uh, what happened before. Uh, Friedman regarded the 1920s as the heyday uh, of the Federal Reserve. Didn't see anything wrong going on there. Okay. This is something uh, Hayek said during his Nobel lecture. Uh, there may well exist better scientific evidence, that is, empirically demonstrated regularities among magnitudes that flop around a lot, for a false theory which will be accepted because it is more scientific than for a valid theory which is rejected because there's no significant quantitative evidence for it. <clears throat> that last Part of the sentence may be an overstatement. I mean, there is historical evidence that makes us think that uh, the interest rates were too low uh, during the 30s or during the 20s. Now, I've already suggested, but I'll do this in, in a more deliberate way, about, about the difference in focus. Keynes attributed the downturn to psychological factors. See, so when he talks about the downturn, he's not really talking about economics, he's talking about psychology, he's talking about animal spirits. So that's what he's looking at to, to justify, you know, to realize, okay, that's why we had a downturn. I suggest that a more typical and often predominant explanation of the crisis is a sudden collapse in the marginal efficiency of capital. The MEC uh, is, here is just entrepreneurial expectations of the profitability of continuing to invest. They get cold feet, okay? They lose the fire in the belly, lose, lose their will, and, and it's contagious. They all pull back, uh, and the economy goes south. So that's, that's, that's his idea is why, why we got the boom ended and the bust uh, going on. Keynes' main focus is on the dynamics of the subsequent downward spiral on, and on policies aimed at reversing the spiral's direction. So he's looking out the window in 1930s, and he sees the economy spiral downward. And he's trying to think up policies that make them spiral back upwards, okay? Independent of just why they started the spiral, but if you really want to know why they started the spiral, psychology, animal spirits, and so on. Okay, that's Keynes. Friedman, he's just dismissive about the issue. Uh, and I, I've learned, I've picked these expressions out of the literature of monetarism. Dismissive about the whole issue of the cause of the initial downturn. Referring to it as, and this is a, only a partial list, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, routine, garden variety recession. Well, what does that mean? I mean, shouldn't the economists be able to explain the economics of a recession? Why is there a recession? No, no, that's just, that's just an ordinary garden variety, run-of-the-mill recession. That's not what we're interested in. Of course, we're not interested in it because we, we don't have the data. We don't have a set of data that will allow us to investigate this econometrically, empirically. Uh, and so instead, uh, we look at the at the post-recession dive into deep depression. And he makes that distinction. There's, there's the recession, and then there's the spiraling into deep depression. And it's the spiraling into deep depression that he wants to analyze. So he's, he's really pretty consistent with Keynes here, except he doesn't mention uh, animal spirits. Okay, So his focus is on the policy blunders that occurred on the heels of the downturn and on the correlation between a decrease in the money supply and the decrease in GDP, that's, that's the Q, output. 
real output is GDP, real GDP, that's, that's uh, the Q, and NV equal PQ. Uh, now, there are lots of other things going on, too, that cause the this, this spiraling, but this was a biggie, the, uh, the contraction of uh, the money supply. And this is not exactly a, a, a paraphrase, but it's in the spirit and in the tone that Milton Friedman uses, especially in lecturing. The correlation between movements in the money supply and movements in the total output leaves no doubt about the central issue. In other words, those things go down together. Uh, and uh, I've, heard, I've heard one commentator say that Friedman speaks in a tone as if he's talking to a, a group of students that were made to stay in after class because of not getting things straight. So that's, that's the tone that he uses. Hayek's focus is on policy-affected aspects of the boom and their implications for the boom's unsustainability. Well, or sustainability here, it doesn't have any. Post-bus post -bus re reallocation of labor and capital takes time, yeah, uh, but the particular dimensions of it, such as the Great Depression, its length and depth, are to be explained largely in terms of the policy perversities that hamper the recovery. In other words, yeah, yeah, Keynes knows that, or Hayek knows the Depression was deep and it was bad, but it was bad because of all the policies of Hoover and Roosevelt, policies of crop destruction, to try to get the prices of the crop up. Okay. They destroyed cotton, they destroyed pigs, they destroyed corn, okay? To try to get the price of pigs up, that doesn't give you a recovery. They, Hoover imposed the tariff, Smoot-Hawley tariff. That doesn't help. Roosevelt had price fixing, Office of Price Administration, that prop prices up, kept prices from adjusting to the fallen money supply, okay? Make work projects, on and on and on. Cartelizing industry, so they could behave collectively as a big monopoly. All of these things took their toll in the Great Depression. Hayek knew that, okay? But it wasn't part of his business cycle theory, because his business cycle theory was aimed at showing why there was a downturn in the first place, why the growth during the 20s wasn't healthy growth. It was unsustainable growth, all right? Many of people have rejected the Austrian theory on the grounds that the misallocation of capital, well, okay, maybe there was some misallocation of capital, but it just wasn't enough to explain how that depression was so deep and why it was so long. Well, no, it doesn't explain that. It wasn't intended to explain that. Nobody ever thought it explained that, okay? But uh, people like Gottfried Hobbler, uh made that argument, uh, Lionel Robbins, and so on, who, both of whom at one time uh, were sort of tuned in to the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Query here, I don't know why it's in orange. I guess we put queries in orange. Can we justifiably say the bigger the boom, the bigger the bust? And you do read that. It's in Rothbard, it's in other places. But if you read Rothbard carefully, he, when he explains why that is true, the bigger the boom, the bigger the bust, he's, he's talking about a bust to reallocate the misallocation that went on during the boom, okay? He talked about the necessary reallocation, meaning made necessary by the reallo by the uh, money the money caused misallocation during the boom. That's what he means when he says the bigger the bus. The more you misallocate, the longer it's going to take to reallocate. Yeah, he didn't mean that somehow the boom in the twenties was so big that it took all of 10 years to fix in, in a recession that uh, in, involved 20-odd percent unemployment. He didn't mean that, <laughs> okay? Because those were caused by all that other nonsense going on during the 30s. 
Okay. So for Friedman, the full analysis of a business cycle consists almost wholly of an empirical accounting of the depression's depth and length, especially the depth uh, in terms of the collapse in the money supply. For Hayek, Austrian theory is fundamentally a theory of the unsustainable boom and the subsequent reallocations of misallocated resources. Accounting for the actual depth and length of the depression that ensues requires an economic and historical account of each particular episode. All right. Now, I put this up here just to drive a point home. Case of the cabbage eating Mississippi monster. Hell, we'll see. Suppose that in late October 1929, a thousand pound monster descended on Mississippi soil. Okay? It spent the next three and a half years eating all the cabbages and quite a few rabbits between Tupelo and Pascagoula. By early March of 33, the monster weighed 4,000 pounds, started at 1,000. Okay? Two investigators are sent to Mississippi to get a handle on the situation. One's from Vienna and one is from Chicago. Okay. <laughs> you know, I googled, I, on images, I googled Mississippi monster, and that's what I got. You know, I <laughs> haven't looked into it. But. So the Viennese investigator asked, where in the world did this hideous thing come from? This is from Vienna. They proceed with the investigation, it turns out on further investigation that the monster was an unintended consequence of some ill-conceived government-sponsored bionics project. Okay. Well, uh, but then case closed, you know, we figured it out. Now here's the Chicago economist. The Chicagoan shows up, shoves the Austrian aside, you know, that this is part of the temperament too, not necessarily Friedman, but of other monitors. Never mind how the thing got here. The real question is, how did it grow from 1,000 pounds to 4,000 pounds? How did an ordinary run-of-the-mill garden variety monster quadruple in weight in 40 months? Okay. Chicago's answer, of course, is it was all those cabbages. Because he couldn't get good data on the rabbits. You, know, you see that problem too. <laughs> what can you do? Correlation between cabbage consumption and weight gain at the Mississippi monster leaves no doubt about the central issue. <laughs> That's, that would be uh, the monitors. Okay. Query. Uh, do we suspect that the data availability is what led the Chicagoan to his conclusion and that the lack of hard data pertaining to the monster's origin caused him to be dismissive of questions about where the thing came from? Okay, so these and other related suspicions are what underlie the message in Hayek's Nobel Address, The Pretense of Knowledge. That's the title of his Nobel Address. I don't think he mentioned Mississippi monsters, but he, he, he might as well, and he should have, okay. Okay, now let's look at Friedman's monetarism. And you still hear, you're not going to see a lot of graphical analysis like I did with the Austrians, or like you could do for the Keynesians, because the monitors pretty much hang their hat on that one uh, relationship. There was a point, 1970, where Friedman set out to exposit monetarist ideas in terms of the Keynesian framework. And it wasn't just the Keynesian cross, it was a step above that called ISLM analysis, where you take into account uh, interest rates and other things. Uh, and he laid it out in, in two successive articles, I think there are two parts of one article over a couple of uh, journal issues. Uh, and so he's showing how you could use the Keynesian apparatus to show what the monitor's conclusions are. That was in 70. In 1999, though, in a New York Times article, he identified that exercise and his involvement in it, he was the author, uh, as the worst mistake he'd ever made to, to try to explain monetarism in terms of Keynesian analytical apparatus. It just didn't work. 
just wouldn't, didn't fly, okay? Worst mistake he ever made. But tellingly, he didn't have any apparatus of his own. <laughs> Beyond that, you know, that's all he did have. So, uh, makes you wonder. With a nearly constant velocity of money, velocity of money is just the rate at which you spend the money that exists. M is the money supply. It's all the money in the economy. Uh, and that would be cash, and it would be some total of checking account deposits. That would be the smallest magnitude that you might want to work with. And each of those dollars gets spent more than once during a year. I buy something from you, and you buy something from somebody else. So you have to multiply M times V to get the total spending, total buying. How much do people buy? Well, here's the money supply they've got, and here's how many times on average each dollar is spent. So M times V is the amount of buying, the amount of spending. Okay. If you look at the other side, P times Q, uh, what does that remind you of? That's the price of something times how much of it you bought. It's capitalized, so it's total Q, all the, all the junk in the universe or in the economy you could buy, times capital P, which is the average price level, consumer price index, for instance. So you multiply P times Q, and that shows you how much somebody sold. You know, the people are selling the Q, and they're getting a price P for it, so that's how much they sold. So in the final analysis, MV equal PQ really just says selling equal buying. Well, all right, <laughs> it does. So it's tautological, and Friedman understands that perfectly. But if you dress it up a little bit, you can milk some ideas out of it. So it goes like this. Uh, let's have output growing slowly. So the price level moves with the money supply. So there's that bar over velocity means it's not changing. Uh, that was then, when he was writing this stuff. Now velocity is all over the map. Okay, the, that's no longer a stable magnitude. But when he was doing his monetarism, it was pretty stable. Had a slight uh, change to it. So there's the growth. Yeah, it's positive, but not much. Now suppose the money supply is, uh, is a pretty big money supply. Well, look at the equations. Something's got to be happened to P to, P to make those two magnitudes equal because buying still equals selling. So what happens, of course, is P rises not quite as much as M, but almost, and not quite, simply because Q rose too. You had some real growth going on, all right? So uh, he milks that out of it. And then uh, an important part that he milks out of it is the direction of causation. Although it's not a rigorous demonstration, but it's plausible. And that the, it goes from M to P. In other words, it's because the central bank increased the money supply that prices rose. It's not that prices rose so much that the Fed decided, boy, I better increase the money supply so people can pay those high prices. Now, logically, you could think it could be that, but it, it's not. It's a, you had the monetary expansion. Why would they do that? It turns out because they depress interest rates. Uh, and goose up the economy when they do that. But that's not part of this theory, okay? Now, the next part is critical to my lecture here. I can't, I'm, I'm watching the clock because I don't want to leave out anything. And that is, there's a long lag with a lag of 18 to 30 months, 30 months, two and a half years. So in other words, you increase the money supply, prices go up, it takes two and a half years for it to go up. Uh, this is in the literature of monetarism as a long and variable lag. I mean, 15, 18 to 30 uh, is, is a pretty wide range there. Uh, in my time in money, I referred to that aspect, that lag, as the soft underbelly of monetarism. They haven't really accounted for the length of that lag. And in one of Friedman's last writings on last books on monetary theory is called Monetary Mischief. I think it came out in 93 or something like that, Monetary Mischief. He recognized this as the major 
unsettled issue of monetarism. It's a major unsettled issue of why in the world it would take that many months for prices eventually to adjust to the money supply. Well, we'll milk that a little bit later and show how that works. Okay. What Friedman did milk out of this, and, and kudos to Friedman for this, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, let's go back to that. That was in a 1968 book called Deficit, Dollars and Deficits, or Deficit and Dollars. Must have been the other way, Dollars and Deficits. Uh, that's probably the most quoted thing out of Hayek, or out of Friedman. Well, good. Uh, we ought to get that message across. And so Friedman's monetary rule is he thinks the money supply should be increased at a slow and steady rate to achieve long-run price level constancy. In other words, here, if you've got that little bit of growth, okay, we'll just get that little bit of money. And he doesn't mean even match it on a year-to-year -year basis, because you don't know how much the economy is going to grow this year. Uh, but look at it on the long term. If the long long term rate of growth is two or four percent or whatever it is, well, increase your money supply year in, year out at two and four, two to four percent, and that probably won't disturb the economy. You'll have constant prices, nearly so, uh, and uh, sustainable growth. Um, but he's in trouble here in two ways. One having price level constancy isn't actually argued for as the, pri as the proper goal. In fact, the Austrians would say that, that you really want increases in productivity to lead to reductions in prices. That gains from productivity can be enjoyed by, by, by customers, by consumers, in terms of getting things for a lower price. Okay, so the Austrians would dispute the price level constancy as, as the goal, and even Friedman himself in his later writings realized that there was something wrong with his monetary rule because it clashed with his general idea that bureaucrats don't do what's good for the economy, they do what's good for themselves. So the Federal Reserve Bank uh, doesn't have the incentive to implement that rule. They have other incentives uh, to pump up the economy, to finance uh, projects by the government and so on, all right? So anyhow, you get a constant price level with that deal. Well, what happens within the Q aggregate? Now we're gonna go Austrian on him. What happens within the Q aggregate as a result of monetary injection? Well, I can do this very quickly because you've seen it before. There's a supply and demand for loanable funds. And even if you want to increase the money supply by just 4% or something like that per year, that money is still going out through credit markets. I mean, the, the central bank lends money into existence. They add to the supply of savings money that was created for the purpose of keeping the price level constant that doesn't involve any saving at all. And so you get that shift to the right of the money of the savings. Uh, so Friedman, though, declares uh, in the 1920s that the golden years of the Federal Reserve. He ignores interest rates during the 20s because they didn't change much. And I add, that is, they fell through the Keynesian sieve. They were sort of out of play before you even got started. Friedman, by the way, has sent me on one occasion uh, <clears throat> a chart of movements in the interest rate during the 20s, just to demonstrate that they didn't change very much. Okay, So he sticks to his guns on that. And the Austrians, Hayek particularly, would, would say, but what if they should have changed but weren't allowed to? And it turns out this is the paradigm case. This is what typically happens in business cycles in the Great Depression, uh, in the dot-com boom and bust. Uh, and it goes like this. During the 20s, 
breakthroughs in technology increased the demand for loanable funds and put upward pressure on interest rates. This was what Mises called the entrepreneurial component of the interest rates. In other words, there's new technology, we can implement it and make a profit. So we need to borrow more money. And more people are trying to borrow money to implement the technology and that was driving interest rates up. Or that would drive interest rates up if the Fed didn't step in and hold them down. All right? So what happens here, the Federal Reserve guided by the real bills doctrine, I won't go into that, <clears throat> but essentially if it says if the interest rates goes up, put it back down. <laughs> you know, we don't need that. Put it back, put it back down. Still miss something here. Okay, so seeing no change in interest rates when they should have risen because of technological advances, Hayek was able to identify some critical forces hidden from the untrained eye. That's what Hayek was talking about when he says uh, that's, that's what you have to look for. There's the query. Which of Friedman's, which view of Friedman's or Hayek's is more firmly anchored in the empirical historical circumstances of the 20s. I think the Austrians are better anchored. Okay, so does Keynes recognize the significance of the loanable funds market in the context of business cycles? No, we've seen already he threw that whole diagram out. No, he denies that saving depends on the interest rate, and he all but denies that investment depends on the interest rate. So he jettisons the loanable funds market theory. For him, saving is dependent only on income, investment, and investment expenditures are based predominantly on psychological considerations, okay? So here's Friedman. Does Friedman recognize the significance? And the answer is no, he assumes this market is working well, and so ignores it in dealing with the key issues of the relationships between the money supply and the price level. For him, the focus is on total output Q, which includes output of consumption goods and investment goods. All right, so up there at the top, saving equals minus A plus one minus B times Y. You don't see any interest rate there, okay? And I equals I sub zero. I know some of you don't like math, but I need to explain that question. If you put a sub zero by a term like that, it means don't ask me anything else about that term, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it just is what it is and we don't know about it. Okay, we can get rid of them. Now with Friedman, he's got MV equal PQ. Now, he wouldn't throw away that diagram, but he doesn't have any use for it, because if you think about it, Q, at, that's total out, output, and so that relationship is something that goes on within that Q. And he's not, he's not analyzing what's within that Q. So he doesn't use the loanable funds market. There it goes, okay, it's gone, you don't need it. Friedman's view of monetary contraction, it's the same as expansion except we're going the other way. Sharp monetary contraction puts downward pressure on P and Q. If P is sticky downwards, he didn't generally think they were sticky downwards, but certainly during the Great Depression, they didn't fall, didn't fall very much, didn't fall very fast, but precisely because of New Deal pro policies and Hoover policies to prop them up. So it's really dangerous to have a money supply collapse and have the government propping up prices. Evidence shows that between October of 29 and March of 33, decreased in was the essential primary dominant cause of the decrease in Q. So if P is either sticky, as Keynes believed, or wasn't allowed to fall much, as Hoover and Roosevelt ensured, then a decrease in M is going to give you a big decrease in Q. 
Okay? Now that's the key again to depression. The correlation between movements in the money supply and movements in total output leaves no doubt as to the central issue. Again, that's, that's uh, Kane's focus. Here's a critical comparison, and I want to go through this pretty quickly, but I think you can see. Uh, I'm going to compare the dot-com boom, boom and bust, that's 90s, and I say cushioned by an underlying real growth. I mean, the, the dot-com revolution, boy, talk about an increase in technology that could be exploited for the, for the good of lots of people. There it was, okay? No question about it, there was something good going on, all right? Uh, the other one is the housing boom and bust. And I don't say cushioned by, I say compounded by mortgage market distortions. Now, the distortions were good for a few people that were able to buy a house and hold on to it and not get caught underwater later. But by and large, overall, it was a disaster from the beginning. So the, the, that aspect of the boom uh, that was driven in large part by uh, mortgage market distortions, you know, holding interest rates down by elim eliminating the risk, not really eliminating it, but fobbing it off through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and then to anybody who wants to buy the derivative securities. And the, the homeowner then doesn't have the risk that otherwise would have been there. Uh, and look at the two cases. In the, in the case of dot-com, you start out with an increase in the demand for loans because people want to take advantage of the new technology in the dot-com industry. Okay, so that puts upward pressure on interest rates. Well, fine, let the market adjust. We have a new equilibrium rate. Uh, we've got more savings, and so those savings can be used to bring to fruition uh, the new technology, the dot-com, but the Federal Reserve wouldn't have it that way. The Federal Reserve wanted to drive that interest rate back down, and they did. So in other words, they increase the supply of money, not, they don't really increase savings, they just add to it some increment of money. And it causes the supply to shift rightward and puts the interest rate back down. But now look what's happening. Now savings is back where it was before. But investment reflects the money provided by the Fed. So you've got investment exceeding savings. Uh, and you've got an overinvestment, you've got malinvestment, because interest rates are lower than they should be. So uh, you really do have to tease that uh, out of the history, because you don't see the interest rate rising. You see it not rising when technological developments suggest that they should. Okay. Now, look at the big contrast with the boom and bust in the housing episode. That didn't start by new technology that started with a distortion of the housing market, okay? And that is, we have increased supply of credit that put downward pressure on interest rates, okay? Now you have all these subsidies to housing. Uh, and when you do that, that, puts, that gives you low interest rates. But guess what, if it had stopped there, then that would have meant that funds that generally were available for, to manufacturers are going the other direction because you're getting more secure loans since the government is, is picking up the risks, okay? So to keep that from happening, they increased the money supply still more, like that. And now, all of a sudden, you really got the interest rates in the basement. That's why you saw interest rates so low around 2004, 2005, uh, and of course, lower still now. And so if you look at this, so you have a double shift in the supply of loanable funds, compounded both the downward pressure on interest rates and the excessive borrowing. 
the artificial boom rode piggyback on the distortion of mortgage markets. So that didn't leave you a cushion to fall back on because you, you've got monetary distortions added to regulatory distortions. So when that sucker comes undone, the economy really is going to be in bad shape, <laughs> as it is, as it was. In fact, there's a little chart that shows you that period back there where the interest rates were too low for too long, although, of course, not nearly as low as they are these days. Okay, I, I'm going to have time for this. It'll, it'll take just a few minutes. Uh, Friedman's plucking model. And this is a, this is an austro monetarist uh, story here, because um, about the time that the Review of Austrian Economics was coming into existence, Walter Block had a particular strategy to get articles from well-known economists, and he, he would challenge them to write negatively about the Austrian theory. Uh, and uh, he challenged Friedman. He said, would you write an article explaining just what it is you think is wrong about the Austrian theory? And Friedman wrote back, and wrote back is right, we didn't do email in those days, but he wrote back and he says, well, I've already done that, uh, and I don't want to do it again. So Block had to ask him very apologetically, I'm sorry I missed it, where did you do it? So what he cited was an uh, interim report of progress on a project he was doing for the National Bureau of Economic Research, published in 64. It's actually in Friedman's book, Quantity Theory of Money and Other Essays. That's what it was, but then he said, and, but I actually didn't mention the Austrians, but I thought you people would know who you are, you know. Uh, so it was left at that. Well, of course, Walter got that literature and read it, and it was something called the plucking model. He called it then at the time. Uh, and here's the way it goes. Uh, Friedman says, if you look at what's going on during a business cycle, let's start with a country that's growing steadily. This is, uh, he called it an inclined plane. I don't know why he used this terminology. Take an inclined, inclined plane that represents uh, growth. And then realize the actual path of the economy is not quite so smooth. But the reason it's not quite so smooth is it dips down occasionally at different extents in different places. And so what you get is something like this. Uh, and he labeled these, or described these, as bust and boom. Although in my rendition, I suggest that what he's calling a boom is actually a recovery. But he called it bust and boom. And so you could think there, there was maybe something in the early 20s and then a big thing, the Great Depression, and then a, a later depression, maybe dot com, okay? That's the way it is. He says those silly Austrians, they're always talking about boom-bust cycles, as if the bust depends on the strength of the previous boom. He says, it's not that way at all. Let's look at the data. We bow before the data. That's a, that's a standard monitor's re, refrain. We bow before the data. And what we see is we don't have boom-bust sequences. We have bust-boom sequences. Bust-boom, bust-boom, bust-boom. And yeah, sure enough, the boom is just about the same as the previous bust. So it's, it's not that the Austrians are just wrong. So they're really kind of cute. But, I'm not sure he said cute. <laughs> but they're just not talking about, they're not explaining anything that needs to be explained because of this bus-boom cycle, okay? Well, it turns out just shortly after that, uh, there was a birthday party for Friedman and uh, he was asked to do a paper. Well, he hadn't worked on monetary theory for years. 
So what he did was write about the plucking model and got it as a lead article in Economic Inquiry. Well, that was great for me because it came out in 93, and so now it's a legitimate target for criticism. So I wrote uh, a comment on his plucking model from an Austrian perspective and submitted it. It initially got rejected, but rejected on the basis that Friedman shouldn't have written that mod that article that he wrote, and so we don't want to waste more paper with a comment on the article. <laughs> Eventually, though, the editor overruled uh, and published the paper in Economic Inquiry. So I have a plucking model, and of course what I show there is that his boom is really a recovery, one, and two, the, the actual boom is something that's already hidden in his incline plane because it's at the high level of aggregation. It's C plus I, okay? And so that gets, that gets hidden away uh, in the incline plane. Okay, what do we got? Oh, there's Friedman. Now, I want to get through this too. We'll, we'll make it. Friedman and Knight versus Hayek and Menger, because I want to link this to my first chapter. How many heard, saw my first article on capital theory? A lot of you see it anyhow. Why was Milton Friedman so unreceptive to the Austrians' capital theory? Uh, and my first answer is because of his attitude towards prices and production. I'll cut, tell you a quick story here, maybe. Uh, I was at a conference in San Francisco, I think it was in 86, and during a break, there was a three-way discussion between me and Leland Yeager and Milton Friedman. Friedman, for some reason or other, was talking about how hard to read Dennis Robertson is. You can't read this book very easily at all. It's really turgid, you know. I don't know why he was talking about that, but he was. And then, all of a sudden, he, he, he interrupted himself. And he turns to me and pointed at me. And when, when Friedman points at you, you know, you kind of pay attention. He pointed at me. He says, he says, I'll tell you another book that's impossible to read. He said, Prices and Production. He said, I challenge you to read that book and tell me what's in it. Okay? Well, right there, you know, he's not exactly warming up to the theory. <laughs> uh, so what does he do instead? Here we're going with this lag again. What goes on in the short run? It's Knight and Clark. All right? Now, let's read through this. We've got time. He starts, the, he starts his story when the Fed has already increased the money supply and it's in the hands of the public. Now, something funny went on in that process, but that's, that's where he starts. So he says, holders of cash will bid up the price of assets if the extra demand is initially directed at particular class of assets, say government securities or commercial paper or the like, the result will be to pull the prices of such assets out of line with other assets and thus widen the area which the extra cash spills. Okay, the increased demand will spread sooner or later affecting equities, houses, durable producer goods, durable consumer goods, and so on though not necessarily in that order. These effects can be described as operating on interest rates, he puts it in quotes, if a more cosmopolitan, I put i.e. Austrian, interpretation of interest rates is adopted, then the usual one of a, refers to a small range of marketable securities. Now here's the killer. See, there's the Knight-Clark model. And even to help you read this, so you can read it without your head swimming, I've put sources in orange and services in green, okay? Let's see if you can follow this. He said, the key feature of this process, he's thinking he's got a hardwired Frank Knight Clark in his mind, and he didn't know what Hayek wrote. The key feature of this process in which interest rates are low is that it tends to raise the price of sources, orange, of both producer and consumer services, green, relative to the price of the services themselves. It therefore encourages the production of such sources and at the same time the direct acquisition of the services rather than the sources. But these reactions in their turn tend to 
to raise the price of services relative to the price of sources, that is to undo the initial effect of the interest rate. Well, if you just convert the Knightian stuff to Hayek stuff, you get a much different story, don't you? You don't get this service and, and sources stuff. But then he goes on, uh, the final result may be a rise in expenditures all the way around, and that's P going up, uh, without any change in the interest rate at all. I mean, the whole boom-bust cycle is finished. Anyhow, at that point, interest rates and asset prices may simply be a conduct through which the effect of monetary policy change is transmitted to expenditures without being altered at all. How could it be altered if all it was doing is juggling sur sources and services? <laughs> okay. What about the actual hardware in the economy? Nothing about that. And I think when he does try to account for the lag, here's what he says. It may be that monetary expansion induces someone within two or three months to con contemplate building a factory within four or five, to draw up plans within six or seven to get construction started. The actual construction may take another six months, and much of the effect on the income stream may come still later. Insofar as initial goods used in construction are withdrawn from inventories and only subsequently lead to increased expenditures by suppliers. So here, what is that's the Austrian theory. That's the Austrian theory. In other words, get rid of sources and services and put in full-bodied capital structure, and his 18 months is simply this period where the economy is overheating and you've got misallocation of resources, and then the rest of it is the Keynesian spiral, okay? So that's what it amounts to. I've got to show you this, forgive me. The, the story here, the story here is, when I was in Menlo Park, that was a short walk to the Stanford Library. Friedman was at the Hoover Institute, and I had heard that he drove a Cadillac and he had MV equal PQ as his license plate. So I went over there with the camera, several different days, sometimes not even finding a Cadillac, let alone the license plate. But I went over there one day and I found two or three Cadillacs, two or three. And I found one, this one, that I took a picture of. However, this one didn't have the MV equal PQ, but at the time I was discouraged. I wasn't going to come back. I was getting ready to leave. So I just took the picture, and I thought, well, Photoshop will do the rest. Okay. <laughs> so I put it on here. And then, and then not too much later, uh, on the blog of ManQ, he said, this was back in 06, he asked about, does anybody know what my license plate was? Well, it turns out, EC10, is that what he teaches, I guess? You know, I, I don't think I would advertise that, but uh, that's what he did. And so, here, here was the discussion. It's kind of small, I'll read it. You know, I hate to spoil things, but I must say I think Milton Friedman has a better plate. And he quotes this. Years ago, trying to find Friedman's apartment in San Francisco, I knew I was on the right location when I spotted a car that said MV equal P, T, T. T was Fisher, Irving Fisher, T for transaction, MV equal P, T. Freeman didn't use T because he couldn't get data for it. It was like the rabbits, okay? So he used Q, all right? And he represented it as Y. In other words, Y is what you earn to buy Q, so okay, we could use Y. So. Uh, and then the next quote, it says, Freeman's plate is MV equal PQ, not MV equal PT. And there's a link. I don't know. Can we get on the internet here? Yeah. Well, there's France. It was the French side. And if you go down there to the French side and see, can anybody read French? It's too small. La voiture of automobiles. Okay, you click that. <laughs> they cribbed my picture off of my website. <laughs> but Friedman does have the name. <laughs> Whoop, went the wrong way. No, I need to get back out of there. 
Anonymous writes, that's pretty ridiculous. And the next one writes, I love economists. <laughs> and Friedman does have the license plate, okay? But it's MV equal PY. Look at his crappy equal sign. It looks like it's electrical tape, okay? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>